afternoon and welcome back to the analyst of Ajay Raman Ravi where we bring to you detailed discussion of important articles from both the Hindu and Indian Express. Today is 2nd December and what are the important articles? Let's have a look. So in the first article, in light of the growing cases of governor sitting indefinitely on the state legislations, we will read about what are the governor's right with regards to holding assent of a state legislative bill. In the second one, I will take you through multiple models, multiple mechanisms of climate financing which are available both at international and at the national level as highlighted because its need has been highlighted by Prime Minister in the recent Dubai COP of 28. Then we will talk about the multilateral grouping of BRICS which is of composed of multiple emerging economies including India and what are its importance. And then we will talk about space phenomena with respect to sun. These are the solar storms and the coronal mass ejection which are frequently seen in news. And in the last we will read about NIA that is National Investigation Agency which is primarily responsible for countering terrorism in India. So let's get started. So our first article here is about governor, office of governor, what are his powers and what is the explicit power to withhold the assent with respect to a particular bill of state legislative assembly. Now this is a hot topic of this year, very very important for the current affair because not just one state legislative assembly but about four of them. Punjab, Telangana, Kerala, Tamil Nadu, they have also alleged to the Supreme Court, they have been filing writ petitions in the Supreme Court saying that their state legislative process have been stifled because of the action of governor where he is indefinitely sitting on the bill. And the current context over here is that a three judges bench that is headed by a Chief Justice of India has observed that the bills that are repassed by the assembly cannot be reserved for the president. Now this context might seem a little difficult to comprehend. We will break down into simpler language in this particular discussion. So hold on for that. This is important from GS2 part of the syllabus where we have to read about the federal structure of Indian constitution. Okay. So here the topic is about governor. So first let's try to understand the office of governor. Indian constitution in part 6 under article 153 states that there shall be a governor in every state of India. Now, this particular constitutional body of governor is also considered as the executive and the constitutional head at the state level. But not only that, it also forms this essential link, an essential pivot or linchpin between the center and state relationship. So therefore, the office of governor is very important for establishing cooperative federalism in India. Now, according to the article 153, it also says that government does not act independently. Rather, it is a constitutional head who is bounded by the aid and advice of the Council of Ministers. So till here, the office of governor and the entire structure is clear to us. Now, we also know that it is not only a head, not only a headman, but also a vital link between the center and the state. So it is very important office for efficient working of center state relationship and the overall federal structure of India. Now, where does the controversy of the office of governor begins? It begins with the giving up or the giving of discretionary powers to the governor. So when the discretionary powers are given, what it means? It means that according to article 163, government has to always be bounded by the aid and advice of the council of minister, except in some cases. And those cases are considered as his discretionary powers. Whether a particular case will be his discretionary power or not, that also will be decided by governor. So here, they are given a, he is given a lot of power in hand. And that too, it is considered a little arbitrary in nature. It is sometimes considered as an iron hand against the functioning of state legislatures, especially those state legislatures which are ruled by the opposition party. So here is where the... Where, here is where the controversy begins. Now, these discretionary powers are of two types. One that are explicitly written in the Constitution of India. These are the constitutional powers and the other ones which depends upon the socio-economic condition of the country. These are the situational power, situational discretionary power. For example, who is to be appointed as the CM of a particular state or when the state assembly needs to be dissolved. All of this amounts into the situational discretionary power of the governor. Now comes 
the another important article so wh while we are trying to analyze this controversy of withholding the assent we need to be very thorough with three articles of the indian constitution one is article 163 which provides for the discretionary powers we have learned about that next is the article 200 and next is the article 201 now 200 the article 200 describes about the constitutional discretion where whenever a bill is presented to a governor after being passed he can take the following method so basically article 200 establishes the procedure of legislation in the state level so it says that whenever a bill is given to a governor what happens he can either give the assent he can either give the assent and the bill gets enacted into an act he can also withhold the assent he can also, in other cases, send back to the assembly for reconsideration or can also send it to the president for his consideration. So these are the three options that can be exercised by the governor while exercising his constitutional discretionary power. Now here is where the whole game starts, the whole tussle between center and state starts because there is no time limit set as to when this consideration has to be completed or till when this withholding of the assent has to be done. There is no time limit given in the constitution but there is a provision mentioned in the same article which says that it should be done as soon as possible which means that the constitution makers did not intend that the governor will exercise the withholding of assent for indefinite amount of time. They understand the importance of autonomy for the state legislature and therefore they said that in the article 200 the withholding of the assent or the reconsideration should be done in a stipulated time. The time is not mentioned, but yes, it should be done as soon as possible. Now, when this article 200 is clear, now let's go into the article 201, which says that when a bill is made to be reserved for the president by the governor under article 200, what are the options available with the president? First one, he can either again give the assent, he can withhold the assent, or he can return it to the legislature for consideration. Now, I hope you have clearly understood Article 163, 200, 201. Now, let's understand the current playground that is going on between the central government, that is the governor, and the Tamil Nadu government. So what happened? Tamil Nadu government was fed up of one thing, that about 10 bills were left pending with the governor. They were not getting passed, including the NEAT bill. So they wanted to fasten up the process. So as a result, they filed a writ petition in front of Supreme Court. And Supreme Court gave the notice to the governor on 10th of November that you should return these bills. You should tell or you should at least communicate to the state legislature why are you withholding the bills. So then on 13th of November, governor finally communicated that he has officially withheld the bill. Till now, it was not even clearly communicated to the state legislature. Now comes 18th November where state exercises the article 200 where it is said that there is one more provision in the article 200 which says that if the parliament or if the state legislature not the parliament if it repasses the bill then in that case with or without amendment in that case assent has to be given by the governor in that particular legislation now he cannot furthermore withhold it or cannot pass it for reconsideration to the president but what happened in the case of Tamil Nadu when this act or when these bills were reenacted by the state legislature, then again 10 days later, governor referred it to president. And therefore, Supreme Court has said in a very harsh word that governor cannot, as written in the context, that bills that are repassed by the assembly cannot be reserved for the president by the governor. So I hope now you have understood the concept or the context clearly. Now, what are some of the judicial observations regarding the right to withholding the assent? See, it is an implicit right that is given to the governor, no doubt about it, but then there are certain limitations which are there. First, that was imposed by the Rameshwar Prasad case. It said that if the grounds of holding or withholding the legislation or the bills is found to be malified, which means if the discretionary powers that is given to the governor gets converted into arbitrary power. What is the difference between discretionary and arbitrary? Arbitrary stands for those discretionary powers which are exercised with a malified intent. So if they are found to be considered or if they are found to be on the grounds of malified or malicious intent, in that case, governor's decision to refuse the assent 
can be deemed unconstitutional that was the first judicial proceeding regarding withholding of assent the second is very very important arunachal assembly uh, case which is of nabam rabia and felix case of 2016 now here it was said that governor's discretion under article 200 is limited and whether to decide it is a the bill should be reserved for the president consideration or not is the only discretionary power he has in that regard he cannot exercise discretion on the fact that how much time he can hold the bill so all of these things cannot be decided by the governor only whether he wants it to be reconsidered by the president or not that is under his discretion this was said by namab rebia case the third one is the telangana petition here it was again said that governor should in no manner act slowly with regards to exercising his right to withhold the assent rather he should do it as soon as possible again something that has been reiterated by the constitution itself so what are the issues with the pendency of the bill see whenever government withholds or sits on the bill for an indefinite number of time amount of time it leads to pendency of the legislation there are multiple issues associated with it first is it compromises with the very governance principle for example transparency and accountability because once governor sits on a bill for example in the case of tamil nadu government has not effectively communicated the reason for because of which he has withheld or he has sat on the bill so therefore there is no communication by the governor in many instances as to why he has withheld the bill and till how long he will be withholding the bill that is the first concern second it holds the legislative process if a governor sits on a bill indefinite amount of time then what happens it leads to delay in the legislative process because the bill wouldn't be passed in the stipulated time this will also lead to delay in the developmental process if the development is delayed and compromised this will also decrease it will also decrease the amount of public trust that people have on executive and on legislature so therefore it also halts the legislative process second is the partial behavior here bargaining federalism can be seen in many cases because you are seeing that such cases can be only seen in those states which are ruled by opposition party so why only such states are seeing these cases because first of all the cooperative federalism which is the essence of democracy is slowly getting converted into bargaining federalism where states which are having favorable government are giving are given more favor are given preferential advantages not only by the central government but also by the governor himself so in many cases upper hand is given to those states or those state legislatures which are dominated by a pro government uh, state legislature so therefore this also creates issue of creating a bargaining federalism structure in india next it undermines the spirit of federalism and the democratic process because in this way governor is also taking away the legislative autonomy that is given by the constitution of india to the state legislature which is also a huge problem so therefore it also attacks the very basic structure of the constitution and last but not the least it distorts the public perception in the public life reality is not that important but perception is as we know the famous quote that caesar's wife must be out of public suspicion and therefore bodies like executive legislative judiciary must also be kept from public suspicion and if in case such inefficiency is seen in the legislative process then the public assumes that either the government is inefficient or either it is a corrupt government and as a result they will lose their trust on the governance and this would be the worst thing to happen in any democracy so these are some of the issues so what are the way forward regarding it first is we need to put up a time frame as to for how much time this particular discretion can be exercised by the governor this is also time and again iterated by multiple commissions for example the working committee of constitution has said that there should be a 4 month time limit the punchi commission has said that there should be a 6 month time limit on the total framing or on the total time which the governor is taking for reconsideration of a bill next the governors must also adhere to the guidelines of article 200 which is given by the indian constitution which which says that the process should be done as soon as possible as you can see the key provision that should be respected here and 
Sarkaria Commission has also said that unless and until the provision is completely unconstitutional, all the other provisions regarding discretionary powers should again be exercised on the aid and advice of the Council of Ministers. So that is very important. This is the second way forward. And the last is having a legal clarity on the role of governors across the India. This is very important and how it can be done by doing deliberations, by doing discussions among the policy makers, among the legislative people of the country, important people of the country, along with civil society organizations. So this will also help us to have a streamlined process as to how governors should function in India. And Rajmanar Commission in this regard has also said that the duties and functions of the governor is very clear according to constitution. He should not act as the agent of center not as an iron hand hidden inside a soft glove, but rather as a linchpin of center and state relation, that is as a constitutional head of the state. So this was about the office of governor and his right to withhold the assent. I hope this topic is clear to you now. Now coming to the next one, this is about climate financing. Because COP28 in Dubai is going on, so Prime Minister Modi has called for having requisite climate financing and technology transfer for developing countries which also want to participate in securing or in fulfilling the Paris goals of limiting our total uh, temperature rise to less than 1.5 degrees centigrade. Now this is a very important topic here we will be learning about multiple mechanisms but before that what is climate finances. So climate finances is nothing but any money, any amount of money that is given or to support the actions, to support the actions which are essentially addressing the climate change. Now it could be anything, it could be ranging from establishing renewable energy plants or from growing drought resi resilient crop in order to build a climate resilient agriculture in your farms. So all of this is considered as climate financing. So why climate financing mechanisms are well established across the world and also in India, but they are pretty much insufficient. Why? What is the reason? The first reason is the very haphazard definition of the climate financing, which leaves a lot many loopholes of interpretation, which are utilized and exploited by the developed countries. So what is the United Nations definition of climate financing? It says that any kind of local, national or transnational financing which is drawn from multiple sources like your private sources, public sources, cooperative societies, individual level, etc. from whichever source to support the mitigation and adaptation action that will address the climate change. Now you can see that this definition is very vague in nature. This is open to interpretation and therefore climate financing has not been very effective in the world right now in order to address our final goal of achieving a temperature rise limited up to 1.5 degrees centigrade. Now let's begin by studying the evolution and what are the different financial mechanisms that exist across the world. Before that let's talk about its origin. So the awareness of climate financing started with the awareness about the rapid accelerated climate change and that awareness was first made on an international level by United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change which was adopted in 1992 in Rio summit. Now Rio summit gave birth not only to this apex climate change control organization, regulatory organization, which is responsible for conducting the conference of parties on annual basis, one that you are seeing in Dubai right now. But it has also created for the first time some of the financing mechanisms because it realized one principle. This principle was of the CBDR, common but differentiated responsibilities and respective capabilities. Because one thing was clear, that world is not equal and the responsibility therefore should not also be equal. As we know some of the developed countries like USA, Russia, etc, Britain, they were the first one to get industrialized. So they were the ones who took, who took rampant industrialization and also rampant pollution started from there. Emission of greenhouse gases was completely responsible, irresponsible back then. This eventually took up, so for example, in order to limit our total temperatures, to 2 degree to 1.5 degree centigrade, what is required? We require limitation of the carbon space, total amount of release of greenhouse gases. Suppose I have got 100 units with me and I am only permitted now to release 100 units. 
in order to safeguard my overall temperature to 1.5 now since 1950s the countries who have been the historical polluters the pre industrialized countries they have already consumed more than 50% of the portion 50% of the greenhouse gas emissions have already been done by them now we are only left with the other 50% of the space now we as the developing countries would also need to industrialize ourselves in order to achieve economic growth and development so we also would be industrializing so you can see countries like china and india which are now becoming the largest emitters of greenhouse gases the largest polluters but we are not the only culprit because the the, the clear culprit over here is the historical polluters who now are going down on their emissions but eventually they have taken up a lot of carbon space so we are left with literally nothing now what about the other countries the least developed nations or the other developing countries they are left with more less amount of space and that raises the concern therefore there needs to be differentiated responsibility more responsibility should be adorned by the historical polluters who are the huge culprits and less should be given upon those who are in the developing phase or who are suffering from the loss and damage that has been caused by the historical pollution for example the island nations so therefore what we need we need to have common goal of achieving the paris goal but at the same time we should be having differentiated responsibility and because we have differentiated capabilities some are more advanced technologically more advanced financially more advanced like the historical polluters like the developed nation they should be coming forward and helping the least developed countries and the developing nation this principle was laid down in the rio summit 20 in the rio summit 1992 now came the first ever instrument for financing climate changes which is or financing addressal remedies for climate change this is the global environment facility now this facility is actually considered as a family of funds or as a fund of fund because it comprises of multiple funds or multiple initiatives it it first of all so okay i also need to tell that the rio summit led to the formation of three organizations one was unfccc then there was uncbd convention on biodiversity and then there was desertification convention combat desertification now all these three have got their financing by gef global environment facility this is very important you need to remember but one more fun fact that gef was actually founded by world bank back in 1991 now it is no more governed by world bank it is governed by its own gef council since 1994 so now it's an autonomous independent body but it is responsible for funding not just the three sisters of rio summit but also the minamata convention but also the stockholm convention for persistent organic pollutants more about that in some other session so anyway this is the first one now if you see it in a way there are three funds established for climate financing the first and the foremost is gef the second one is the adaptation fund now adaptation fund is established to perform adaptation measures in the developing nations and this was developed as a part of kyoto protocol kyoto protocol was responsible for giving a very structured financial uh, uh, climate financing mechanisms for example the clean the clean development mechanism adaptation fund joint implementation carbon credits all these theories are coming from kyoto protocol so it also was from kyoto protocol and it says that 2% of the total carbon credits that are earned by the developed nations from pursuing their clean development mechanisms that will be given to the adaptation fund now who manages adaptation fund in india very very important from prelims this is nabard coming to the third one this is gcf now this green fund is responsible for taking care of only climate related mechanism climate related funding this was not in the case of gf because it was taking care of biodiversity also desertification also mercury pollution etc but gcf is specifically is specifically devoted to addressing the climate change issues this was established for the first time in the cancun summit of 2012 2010 and it was established finally in 2011 now the next are special climate change fund 
this is there to perform technology transfer to perform adaptation capacity building etc and this is administered by gef only so gef also administers two funds the this for first one is the special climate change fund and the second one is the least development or the least developed countries fund the least developed countries fund and sccf both both got evolved in the same year 2001 while special climate change fund is responsible for capacity building least developed is particularly responsible for empowering the least developed nations like vanatau like example the the maldives for example such nations which are more particularly affected by the climate change and to help them conquer or take up their national adaptation programs of action so this is about the least developed countries fund now we understood eventually that mitigation and adaptation with regards to climate change are not the sufficient measures what we also need is to cover the loss and damage that has already been caused by the historical pollution so now comes the setting up of the loss and damage mechanisms under the warsaw mechanism so warsaw mechanism relates to the loss and damage the concept of loss and damage says that any loss in the social sphere in the economic sphere that has been caused and that is irreversible now should also be compensated by the historical polluters or by the developed nations so therefore we need an operationalized loss and damaged fund this was first of all ideated in 2013 but it was operationalized only in this cop that is the dubai cop 20 uh, which is in 2023 there is another new concept of new collective quantified goal so this was for the first time introduced in the in the copenhagen cop of 2019 and the target was such that all the developed countries should come together and set a new quantified goal that they will be devolving 100 billion dollar per year for the adaptation mitigation efforts of the developing countries and the least developed countries but what was the result in an oecd report very frequently very recently it was seen that it could only it could only be achieved at 80 billion dollar investment by 2021 so therefore we have breached and definitely failed the target so now the target has been revamped and it has to be prioritized before 2025 so deliberation on new collective quantified goal is also going on in this particular summit now what are the climate financing mechanisms in india it first started from clean energy fund now this was based on converting the polluting form of energy for example energy that is derived from thermal power plants use of coal which is more polluting in nature converting that into renewable energy and how to do that to imply polluter pay principle on the people or on the organization agencies which are either importing the coal or producing the coal so they will be they will be imposed with some amount of they will be charged by some cess and that cess has to be paid back in this fund in order to develop renewable energy infrastructure and technologies in india the second one was national adaptation fund for climate change this was introduced in 2015 and then there was very important campa fund fund that was responsible for the for mandatory afforestation compulsory afforestation in india so whatever forested land was diverted for the non forested purposes for example setting up of mining or industries etc they have to be compensated with an equivalent amount of land in the non forested area and in case you cannot get or compensate in a non forested area then you double up the amount of compensation in a degraded forest land that was the idea of campa funds 90% of this fund was given to state government and 10% was retained by the central government another very important initiative which modi along with ua has recently launched in the cop 28 is the green credits initiative see we already know about green credit it has been already introduced by the kyoto protocol but it was limited only the green credits right now that is working in the world is limited only for climate change it is limited only for greenhouse gases so now we want to move beyond pollution or climate change or greenhouse gases and move into other aspects of ecosystem like soil and water conservation so providing green credits or extending them to conservation of water conservation of soil by plantation on the degraded lands creating river catchments or the buffer areas rejuvenating and reviving the natural ecosystems like example wetlands ponds etc 
and also one more thing is given under green credits initiative that it will be obligated on the private companies as a part of their corporate responsibility corporate social responsibility that is csr so this green credits initiative has just now been launched by india it can get us in upsc as well so this was about the climate financing models and mechanisms of world and india okay one more question for you what is green washing what is the concept of green washing kindly note it down in the comment section now coming to the next topic this is brics so why is this a news because argentina will not be joining the brics blog of the developing economies next year as it is said by their senior official of the newly elected president brics is very important multilateral organization often asked by upsc examination especially in prelims this is one such sample question this which we will be answering after discussing this particular topic so first of all what is brics brics is a multilateral cooperation organization which is responsible for not only having social cooperation but economic development economic cooperation political cooperation and security cooperation in the region it also wants to have south south cooperation in the world it also wants to have a more equitable power play in the world countering the polarized world and world that is dominated by us and russia so first let's understand the context clearly so what happened brics is thinking of expanding itself so in the august in its august johannesburg summit that happened in 2023 this year they decided that they will go from 5 members to 11 members which means including six more members so argentina was one among the member who was invited but what happened the politics of argentina changed with the arrival of the new president so this president had more conservative policy and he was against few countries like china which follows the communist principle it was against brazil which follows a more leftist approach so therefore they were against or they were already against argentina's new president policy is already against these two countries and now it is also said that it is not willing to join the brics because it has completely downplayed the role of brics so does brics deserves this downplay or not let's analyze from this infographic so when we talk about this multilateral grouping let's have a look it includes 40% of the global world population it also holds 50% of the total world economic growth that is happening right now it has got 26% of the total world area and about 23% of the total world gdp as of 2018 and it has also grown further now it has also got 13% of world bank power and 14% of imf quota shares which mean that this particular multilateral organization is very very significant in changing the world order completely if it becomes efficient so now let's talk about what called for the evolution of brics so it got formulated the idea of brics formulated in 2001 by jim o'neil of goldman sachs when his report said that these developing economies should come together at least four of them should join hands together and start emerging as development partners so what happened these came, these four friends came together this was brazil russia india and china four of them came together and started holding up informal meetings which comprised only of their foreign ministers not the head of states and where were the meetings getting held it was getting held at the b set of your united nation general assembly conferences so they saw that these interactions are actually becoming very successful so they thought that let's grow our relationship and let's now also make the head of states meet with each other and convert ourselves into a formal grouping so finally in 2009 the big brother russia was called upon and he was russia was responsible for holding the first bric summit remember this is not brics south africa has not joined yet this is bric and first bric was was conducted in russia and the agenda was to reform the global financial architecture which was overwhelmed either by world bank or either by imf both of which were heavily denom denominated by dollars and heavily dominated by usa so they wanted to counter that they wanted to create a more inclusive financial architecture now finally in 2010 bric becomes brics by including south africa in it so now you know when south africa got included now what is the composition and the goal the initial composition was only to reform and to have an inclusive financial structure as i've already told you in order to counter the dominancy of world bank and imf but eventually 
it broadened up now they are calling for more inclusive equitable sustainable and mutually beneficial development of not only them but of also all the other developing countries they also had multiple diverse objectives in this regard first was the economic cooperation so economic cooperation included them having a lot many increase an increase of interest in the trade and investment deepening and integration of their markets and also signing a lot of agreements which gave us brics business council the cra which we'll be reading in the next slide the new development bank it also encouraged people to people exchanges in order to deepen the ties between them because we know that they are also talking about the social cooperation so here young diplomats forum civil brics media forum etc some of the examples where people are sitting together informally in order to have more deeper cooperation then political and security cooperation they also wanted to they also want to have inclusive sustainable development in south south so therefore they are also calling for a sustainable and equitable global south south cooperation then whatever regional and international security concerns are faced by individual nation they also want to talk about that discuss their best practices policies deliberations etc so basically they are multi dimensional in their goals in their composition what is the cooperation mechanism they are also working at three tracks the first track track one diplomacy stands for that kind of diplomacy which has interaction or engagement of only the government to government the track to diplomacy calls for that kind of diplomacy which calls for engagement between business and enterprises and third one calls for diplomacy or engagement between civil society organization or people to people so it is performing track 1 track 2 and track 3 kind of diplomacy now what are the achievement of brics so far so first and foremost was the development of new development bank this was to counter adb this was to counter world bank imf etc now this was set up the idea was first postulated in new delhi summit the fourth brics summit held in new delhi the aim was to create or to mobilize resources for the infrastructure and sustainable development project in uh, and among these member nations then the sixth brics summit in the fortaleza is finally responsible for bringing out the new development bank this is very important this question has been asked by upsc as well another important fact is that the amount of stakes each individual country has is equal that means all the countries together have got a share of have got equal share of say 20% as you can see from this infographic now comes the next arrangement this this is the contingent reserve arrangement this is to protect against any contingency or emergency because a lot many financial crises were happening the asian crisis of 2008 etc so there it was seen that we need to protect ourselves from the fragility of dollar investment so therefore they thought that we might create a similar forex reserves at our end so that we will be able to fight against any upcoming global financial crisis so therefore in order to provide short term liquidity support to the member nations by performing currency swaps so that their forex reserves can be bolstered so that their inflation can be curbed and the balance of crisis situation can be managed a 100 billion dollar usd fund was created and as you can see the share the maximum share is held by china and then the second number india so kindly remember the share in the contingency reserve agree agreement or arrangement also the last one is interbank local currency credit line agreement this is a non binding umbrella agreement which calls for the member nations to have bilateral agreement with each other's bank so definitely somebody who is investing in rbi who is investing in india will be subjected to rbi norms and they have to be fine with that so this is about interbank local currency credit line agreement these are some of the achievements that the brics has catered so far now the next topic very interesting one this is about space science solar storms and coronal mass ejection so in this year you are seeing a lot of news of likelihood of solar storms in cme that they can be hitting the earth nasa has been issuing such warnings of late what is the reason we will see but first of all the concept what are solar storms what causes the origin so first of all the basic definition solar storm is any strong radiation that is the result of any disturbance that has happened on the sun which can emanate outward the radiations that can emanate outward across the heliosphere that is the region of the influence of sun or the electromagnetic radiations of the sun so this was about solar storms 
Now, what are the coronal mass ejection? Large explosion of plasma and magnetic field. What is the difference between the two? In the first case, you are only seeing emittance of radiation, radiation emitting out of the sun. But in the second case, you are seeing that plasma or a fourth form of matter is also getting emitted. So therefore, both of them together are very deadly for the grid system of Earth because it impacts the magnetosphere of the Earth. But before that, what causes the origin of solar storms or the coronal mass ejection? So first and foremost, what is the sun? It is a giant hot body of gases. Now, it is so hot, especially the corona part, the outer most part of the sun is so hot, of about 1 to 2 million Kelvin, that any kind of matter cannot really exist in its condensed form. So what happens when any kind of matter is subjected to such a high temperature, it loses the bond and results into plasma. That is the fourth form of matter, which means that here the matter exists in ionized state. In ionized state where freely charged particles are floating in space or electrons are floating in space, that is plasma. So sun essentially is made up of plasma. Now because plasma is having electrons free flowing, flow of electron is known as current. Whenever current flows, electric field gets generated and you know that electric field and magnetic field are two perpendicular forces to each other. So wherever magnetic field flows or wherever electric field flows perpendicular to it, to it generates a magnetic field. Now this magnetic field is responsible for carrying out the huge amount of radiation from the sun across the heliosphere. So you can see that these radiations coming out, it impacts the entire boundary of the solar system including the earth and causes the emittance of these radiations. It travels these radiations coming from the sun to larger distances and also impacting magnetosphere that is created around other planets. So this was about the origin of the radiations. These radiations are known as solar winds. But if the intensity of these winds gets high, then these are known as solar storms. Now what causes solar mass ejection? Now we know that there is strong occurrence of magnetic field on the surface of the sun. But sometimes what happens, there is curling of the magnetic field within the surface of the sun. So therefore, this is the source point and this is the, this is the sink point. It, both of them lies in the sun only. Therefore, there is no flow of the energy. A lot of pressure gets generated on these two points because heavy amount of magnetic flux is damping it down. Now, as a result, these regions will become more cool as compared to the rest part of the sun. So these are known as dark spots. Dark spots because radiation is not coming out from them, they become more cooler. Now, the more the number of dark spots in the surface of the sun, the more is said to be the solar activity. And the year of 2025 and 24 are actually considered to be the year of solar maximum. That is when the sun will be showing maximum amount of solar activity. Now, because these dark spots are getting created, they are also creating a lot many pressurized magnetic fluxes over them. Now, the moment one fluxes breaks away, because it is already condensed with a lot of pressure, it moves in such a in such a violent way that it not only releases or takes away the radiation, but also the constituent plasma away from the sun towards the other planets of heliosphere. And this results in the ejection of not only the solar storms, but also the coronal mass, that is the plasma. So I hope you have understood the concept. This is, this is the ejection of solar winds, emission of solar winds, solar storm if the intensity goes high and coronal mass ejection if the mass that is the plasma also starts emitting from the sun and why all of this happens because of the creation of dark spots why does dark spot gets created because of the bending of the magnetic field on the surface of the sun okay now what are the impact of solar storms and CME on the earth definitely earth also has its own magnetosphere it is protected by its magnetic field so whenever another magnetic storm comes, geomagnetic or another heliomagnetic storm comes, it kind of spreads or deviates that storm or those radiations so that it protects Earth. But when the storm is very high in intensity, when CME is coming, then what happens? Anything that is, that is affected by electricity, for example, the GPS system, the satellite system, the power grids, the telecommunication, all of them, the internet lines, all of them can get affected. 
therefore it disturbs because it disturbs the earth's magnetic field it also has implication on the power grid the telegraph line the telephone line radio communication gps satellite etc can be disrupted and this is also seen in some of the cases for example the carrington event of 1859 that took place in the caribbean island so there because of the very huge cme the coronal mass ejection the entire telegraph lines were burnt and many were dead the second one was a great magnetic storm 1989 of the quebec island of canada there similar condition was seen where radio communication channels were disrupted and the very recent halloween storm of usa 2001 was also seen this was also asked by upsc in its optional geography optional paper so halloween storms is also associated with geomagnetic storms or coronal mass ejection which is led to the disruption of anything or any grid that is affected by electricity now last topic of the day this is nia national investigation agency what is the context that it has recently charged eight for allegedly supplying explosive drones to cpi who is giving the power of to the nia to exercise such role such function we will see in this discussion so first of all the background of nia see it is investigation agency it is responsible for investigating those offenses which can affect the sovereignty security and integrity of the nation what are the particular offenses that affect the sovereignty security integrity these are the terrorist offenses or terrorism related offenses so therefore nia is that premier agency or that premier central agency which is responsible for performing counter terrorism operations or counter terrorism law enforcement in india that is the role of nia and it was formed on the outset of the mumbai terror attack of uh, 2611 the very infamous one and the act was nia act of 2008 now what is the jurisdiction it is very interesting and you must note it down from prelims point of view first and foremost the entire india is under its jurisdiction the, all the states uts uh, entire india entire islands as well then it also has got certain cross border jurisdiction how any indian citizen or any person in service or any registered ship and aircraft which is not located in the boundary of india but abroad is also under the jurisdiction of nia then any person who has committed schedule offenses against india's interest for example harshdeep singh nijar was one of the case so therefore he was also that case was also instigated by nia and one interesting thing about it is that it has got special courts for conducting the trials now what are the various laws which are enacted by nia here is the list of it you can have a reading some of the most important ones are anti hijacking uapa sar convention weapons of mass destruction is also covered narcotic drugs psychotropic substance act is also covered so these are the list you can utilize it for prelims elimination now what is the working of nia so nia can have uh, can have basically working on entire territory of india as we know but who recommends the cases and who makes the referral so the first referral if a state government wants any kind of investigation to be conducted by the central agency which is under which is under ministry of home affairs headquartered in new delhi then center has to make a referral this referral under section 6 of the nia act of 2008 now this referral will be considered by the union government or the central government and upon due deliberation then it will only refer it to nia now what is the role of central government it not only gives referrals of multiple cases to the central government of union or of state nature but also provides sanction for prosecuting the accused under the scheduled offenses of the central government then what are some other pointers so in this particular case we are seeing that they have they have charged against the supplying of explosives drones to maoist so here we can say that anything against internal security or internal security threatening agents can also be adjudicated by the nia so there is exclusive left wing extremism cell of the nia to effectively deal with such cases related to red corridors of india then after investigation such cases are placed before nia special court you must know that special courts are also created under nia so all of this was a good fodder point for your prelims preparation i hope you have enjoyed the discussion so thank you so much have a nice day